Hello, everyone. Thank you again for joining us at the 2023 Sloan Sports Analytics Conference Competitive Advantage Talks presented by Kager, also known as Kraft Analytics Group. My name is Evan Lefkowitz. I'm a first year MBA student at MIT Sloan, and it is my honor to introduce our panel, our presentation today, The Elam Ending Reaches the MBA G League. Please join me in welcoming our speaker, Nick Elam, originator of The Elam Ending. Thank you. Well, thank you. And I want to thank all the organizers of this event for the opportunity to speak. I want to thank Evan Lefkowitz, who's been such a great support leading up to this event. So I'm here to present the Elam Ending Reaches the NBA G League. It is a joy every time I get to speak about this concept. And whenever it reaches a milestone like this, like being implemented in the G League and being implemented successfully, it's cool for two reasons. One, because I get to look back and think about how far this project has progressed up to this point. Uh, and it's also cool to think about the potential for it to continue to grow in the future. So uh, we'll start with a quick history of the Elam ending and throughout the presentation, I'll sprinkle in some quotes and highlights. Uh, and then now that we've seen the, e the Elam ending implemented in the G League, we can start to compare it against other leagues and events that have used the Elam ending like TBT, the basketball tournament and the Canadian Elite Basketball League. Uh, get into some, some micro discussions about some different scenarios and strategies that are used under the Elam ending and thinking about, well, is there a way to modify rules to make the Elam ending even better than the way that it's working? And then the last two bullet points are more of a uh, macro discussion, thinking about uh, with all the different versions of the Elam ending that are out there, what are the best versions? So the history of this concept is well documented. This goes back to 2007, uh, research effort, research and outreach, uh, all these different versions, uh, reaching out in the world of basketball to get this implemented. Finally, in 2017, uh, this concept came to life and you see the events and the leagues that are highlighted there, and different versions that are being used. So the ones in green, I would call those uh, sprint to the finish versions of the Elam ending, like TBT uh, gets rid of the clock for the last four minutes of the fourth quarter, and uses plus eight to set the target score. Uh, the Canadian Elite Basketball League gets rid of the clock for the last four minutes of the fourth quarter and uses plus nine to set the target score. For the G League, for regular season games, uh, where they only use it for overtime, they get rid of the clock for overtime and it's plus seven. Again, all those, I would call those sprint to the finish type versions where when the clock goes off, you're already pretty close to the finish line. <clears throat> and then the ones in yellow, uh, we've seen different versions where it's a more extended stretch of untimed play. Uh, the all-star game where you get rid of the clock for the entire fourth quarter and you play plus 24, or the G League Winter Showcase Tournament where uh, all games were played without a clock in the fourth quarter and you play plus 25. You get a more extended stretch of untimed play. So it's really fun to see and hear what people throughout the basketball world uh, think of this concept, whether they're players, or whether they're leaders or coaches in the women's and men's uh, college basketball realm, or members of the media, or people who have been in media or been coaches and now are in media, like Seth Greenberg, uh, people immersed in the analytics world, or even people outside of the world of basketball. It's been really fun to hear all the different takes about the Elam ending. So. Now that we have the, this concept in the G League for this season, and in, again, in the regular season, it's only for overtime, so you don't know which games you might see this type of a finish and which ones you don't. And so uh, it actually happened on the first night of the season. We see the Motor City Crews and the Cleveland Charge. Uh, it was tied at 106 at the end of regulation. So they're playing first to 113, wins the game. And let's see how it plays out. Reset. Shot clock has moved down to 14. Now it's to 10. Merrill for the win. He got it. There it is. That's how you do it on the weave. There's your Elam ending. I love it. I love it. Charge 113. Cruz 111. See, that's a fun finish to a fun basketball game. I love it. So first Elam ending in G League history, off to a good start, really good finish there. 
Now, one thing that's fascinating to people about this concept is the different ways that a game can end, whether it's on a three-pointer, a two-pointer, or a free throw. And uh, in the G League, so this would be all the Winter Showcase games, all 31 of those games, plus any games that happen to go to overtime. This is through January. You see the pie chart there on the left of how different games have ended. Uh, and it's actually very similar to the pie chart of a larger sample of games using the Elam ending format for a TBT going all the way back to 2017 or the Canadian Elite Basketball League back to 2020. Uh, the pie chart there is pretty similar for G League compared to those other leagues, but we're gonna revisit this comparison uh, a little bit later. One thing that's a feature of the Elam ending is that it makes it more suspenseful at the end of games. It makes it more likely that you could uh, see a late comeback compared to the time format. So in that winter showcase, uh, whether it's in the early part of the fourth quarter, seeing teams come back, uh, or when a team really had their back against the wall and couldn't give up one more point, we're seeing some of these dramatic comebacks or near comebacks, adding suspense to games that would otherwise uh, seem like they were in hand under a time format. One thing that uh, people are also really interested in with the Elam ending is its effect on time. I actually think that this is one of the misconceptions about the Elam ending, and it's that it's just meant to speed up the game. That's actually, I wouldn't even consider that among any of the primary aims of the Elam ending format to speed up uh, the game, but uh, people do keep an eye on this, whether it's the effect on actual time to play, uh, that untimed portion of the game, we're seeing it trim some time off of there or if you just measure it in terms of game time, this would be just the amount of time that the ball uh, is in play for live ball play, trimming some time off there. So we're seeing some of the effects uh, in G League play. So that's kind of a snapshot overall of how it's working in the G League. And then, so it's off to a good start. And then I, I often consider myself some of the, the toughest critic of this format, thinking of how to fine tune it to make it even better. And so, Looking at it on a macro, or I'm sorry, a micro level, some different specific scenarios, uh, some classic strategy debates within an Elam ending format. So one of them is what I call the three-two-one scenario. This is where the offense is exactly three points from the target score, the defense is one or two points away, and the question is, well, from an offensive standpoint, do you hunt a three to try to win the game right there? And really, also from a defensive standpoint, do you foul to prevent that game winning? three-pointer, where there are some uh, leagues and events where really you have that option. There are no deterrents against fouling there. And so uh, we see how it's played out in leagues and events that don't have that deterrent. You have the option if you're on defense, if you want to foul or not, we see how it's played out there. Some teams choose to foul, some teams choose not to foul. <clears throat> and then other leagues and events, they do have deterrents in place, whether it's Canadian Elite Basketball League, they have what's called an unsportsmanlike foul, that's a FIFA rule. You can't really foul there, you have to play it out naturally. Or in TBT, since 2020, they've changed the way they administer free throws on a foul on the floor, where really it takes away any incentive to foul. So really, in those cases, the defense doesn't really have an option, you have to play, play it out. And so you see how it's worked out for uh, the defenses in those cases. It's a little counterintuitive that when uh, you take away that option for the defense, they don't really have the option of fouling, it's actually working out a little bit better for them. But this is a small sample and that's not really uh, the takeaway here. I'm not looking at this from a coach's or player's standpoint of what strategy you should deploy. It's more from a fan standpoint. And I can tell you without a doubt, watching all these games, it is more fun to see this scenario play out when there is not a foul there. Regardless of who wins the game, it is more fun uh, to see these uh, situations play out more fluidly, this 3-2-1 scenario play out more fluidly. So the question is, well, is there a way to ensure that it plays out more fluidly? And the answer is yes, and we've actually already seen it. Uh, we've seen it in TBT since 2020, and this is a rule modification I would recommend for any league or any event that implements this type of a format, and that is when there is a foul on the floor during the untimed portion of the game instead of uh, two shots, it's one shot and the ball. And there's a number of reasons why I would advocate for that. One, uh, just philosophically, even if there's no such thing as the Elam ending, I think that this fundamentally makes more sense for how you would uh, administer free throws on a foul on the floor. But another big benefit is 
those three, two, one scenarios, it allows it to play out in a more fluid and thrilling way. Uh, you, you're down to a sudden death situation and you get that hold your breath, hold your breath moment with a three pointer in the air to potentially win the game. Uh, I think that's what we want to see. Another benefit of this rule change is that it reduces the percentage of games that end on a free throw. And it just goes along with the overall spirit of the Elam ending. It, uh, it shifts focus back to live ball play. That's what the Elam ending is all about. We want to settle things and decide outcomes of games through live ball play, and this rule does exactly that. So a number of different benefits of this rule change that I would advocate for. So now let's look at this comparison again of how games are ending. Uh, on the left, we're going to look at leagues and events that use a traditional foul on the floor rule, and you see the pie chart there. But now we compare that to the right. This is just TBT since 2020, since they've implemented that rule change where a foul on the floor, again, it's one shot in the ball instead of two free throws, and it has uh, that effect of reducing the percentage of games that end on a free throw. So let's see this rule in action. So this is going back to TBT 2020. This is the bubble year. First year that they implemented that rule change. Uh, here's an example of a game that comes down to, again, what I would call a 3-2-1 scenario. The offense is exactly three points from the target score. The defense is one or two points away. In this case, two points away. Uh, without this rule modification, you might have a debate of whether overseas elite should foul here on defense. But when you have this rule modification in place, uh, there is no option to foul, so you have to play it out more naturally, and here's what happened. Three, Marcus Keene behind the line. Fouls to give. Looking. Creek. Got it! Sutherland can't wins, and they go to the championship. So we get a fun finish there. Here's another example. This is one year later. This is 2021. This is the championship game of TBT. $1 million, winner take all. Happens to come down again to a 3-2-1 scenario. The offense is three points away from the target score. The defense is two points away. And here's how this played out. They need three. It's hard to get to the free throw line. Now this is a matchup Bryce has. Sides bucket. Got it! They have to be wins it! So again, the uh, again, I would advocate for that rule that allows those three, two, one scenarios to play out more fluidly uh, to, again, take that eliminating to the next level. Another scenario is what I would call the two, two, one scenario. And this is not a scene as often, but uh, this would be where the uh, offense is at the free throw line. They're exactly two points from the target score, but they only have one free throw left to attempt. Their opponent is one or two points away from the target score. And the question is, well, should you intentionally miss that free throw to try to prolong what could be a game-winning possession? And it's actually been surprising to me that in all the years of TBT and CEBL, we actually haven't seen any teams try this. And I don't know if it's necessarily an advisable strategy, but I've actually thought that somebody would have tried it at some point. Uh, didn't see it at the Winter Showcase where somebody tried intentionally missing a free throw. We saw it a couple of times in the regular season overtime, uh, but again, it hasn't become a prevailing strategy yet. But I think the point here is that uh, if this were to become a prevailing strategy, I think that's a strategy that would get stale, and I think we want to kind of prevent that from becoming a prevailing strategy or a commonly used strategy. And I think there's a pretty easy and elegant way to uh, prevent that from ever happening. It's a concept I would call free throw insurance. And if you get into a scenario like that, the Defensive coach, if they're worried about the opponent potentially missing that free throw on purpose, trying to prolong uh, that game-winning possession, they can cash in, again, what's called free throw insurance. That would allow the offense to choose any player on the floor uh, to shoot that last remaining free throw, and, but they would do it with a vacant lane, an empty lane. There's no opportunity for a rebound. The defense is going to get the ball back regardless, make or miss. And what this does, why it's a nice compromise, is that 
the offense, they get to choose their best free throw shooter, so they have a greater chance of making that last free throw, so that's good for them. The defense doesn't have to worry about uh, giving up a cheap rebound there. They're guaranteed to get one more possession. And from a fan standpoint, again, it's what the Elam ending is all about, is it's fostering a more authentic style of play. You're going to be guaranteed uh, a thrilling finish, kind of a sudden death finish there. So that's why I would advocate for this rule change if that intentionally missed free throw strategy ever becomes a prevailing strategy. We haven't seen that yet, but if it becomes more common, I think it's worth addressing. So taking this to a more macro discussion of, well, what's the best version of the Elam ending? It, it, it is meant to have different versions and be customizable for leagues and events uh, to tailor it to their style, their preferences. Um, there are those versions that I would call sprint to the finish versions, where when you shut off the clock, you're only seven or eight or nine points away from the target score. There are those that have a more extended stretch of play uh, where it's, say, 24 or 25 points away from a target score. When you think about the overall considerations of what this format is meant to do to, pr to promote a more authentic, assertive, uh, suspenseful, fluid, and exciting style of play, give us more memorable game ending moments, Actually, I would say all those versions are solid and effective in doing that. But I think about it when you go to that next level in the considerations from a fan standpoint, uh, from being in the arena for so many of these games, I can tell you when it's a sprint to the finish version of the Elam ending and that clock goes off and you're only seven or eight or nine points away from a target score, there is just a different energy in the arena when the clock goes off and you can feel the finish line close by. What we get is just an unmatched intensity on the court for that entire final stretch of play. Uh, when, for, from the fans, what's very common is that they will get on their feet and stay on their feet for that entire final stretch. And that's different from, say, a version of the Elam ending where when the clock goes off, you're 24, 25 points from the target score. There's just too much of an opportunity to settle back in your seat and get comfy, and there's no guarantee that you're gonna get back out of your seat again. So that's from the standpoint of people in the arena. And I would also say, uh, thinking about it from somebody who's even in the arena, they're going about their lives, uh, games going on, they, they have the Elam ending app, you know, whenever that comes out, and they get that alert that says that the clock goes off in a certain game. Well, again, if you're 24, 25 points from a target score, it's kind of like, okay, that's great, but get back to me when it's a little bit closer to the target score. Whereas if you get that alert and the clock goes off in a game that you care about, maybe a game that you don't even care about, and you're only seven or eight or nine points away, you're much more likely to stop whatever you're doing and find some way to watch that final stretch. And I truly believe that that can become, uh, if, if that version of the Elam ending, a sprint to the finish version were to become more prevalent, that that has the potential to become just an absolutely engrossing, addicting phenomenon uh, in the sports landscape. I think the ceiling is much higher for a uh, sprint to the finish type version of the Elam ending rather than uh, something that has a more extended final stretch of untimed play. So to recap, Again, looking at the implementation of the Elam ending and G League, it's been solid, it's been effective. It's meeting all those primary aims that we looked at on the previous slide, just as it has been in other leagues and events that have implemented that. Even though it's been effective, I think there's a way to fine tune it to make it even better. There's these two uh, rule modifications that I would advocate for that I think can take it to the next level. And then again, thinking about it from a macro perspective of what's the best version of the Elam ending, uh, I love them all, and they're all, they've all been solid and effective, but I think there's a way to even go beyond solid and effective to something that's just truly a phenomenon in the sports landscape that would be uh, beyond anything that we've really seen. And I think a sprint to the finish type version of the Elam ending is the way to go for that. Uh, we have a little bit of time for uh, some Q&A, and so uh, we'll go ahead and get to that part of the session here. I saw this hand right here first. What do you think the main barrier is for the EO amending coming to the NBA as soon as possible? Great question. Uh, it's hard to say. I mean, I know if I had a vote, I would be voting for it yesterday to, to be in the EO amending. It's hard for me to, to um, say, but I think 
I think just continual testing. I think the, a big step was having it in the G League this year. Um, and that's a great testing ground. You know, the NBA doesn't just implement things in the G League just for fun. It's because there's serious consideration that it could be implemented at the next level. So I think just uh, getting a more robust sample and making sure that it's uh, doing what it's supposed to do without producing unintended consequences, I think uh, that will make it be more uh, received if it has that more robust sample. Thank you. Yes. One of the benefits I see to the Elam ending is that it also makes the game more relatable because it's kind of how we all play on the playground. Um, along those lines, what are the trade-offs of having like a win by three or win by four rule? Yeah, I, that's one thing I love is that I know on paper when you, you read about or hear about the Elam ending for the first time, it sounds like a very kind of newfangled idea. But yeah, it's actually kind of an old school idea. It's kind of a throwback appeal to it for the way that we always learn how to play. Uh, Going back a long way, I've heard uh, people suggest uh, or just ponder what would happen if there's a yeah, requirement to win by two or three or four or whatever it might be. For one, I think, I think, you, I think you're going to open up the possibility of some unintended consequences in terms of just kind of junky strategies that could happen in there. And then also, I think about it from, you know, I, I've watched so many of these Elam ending games, and I can tell you that the most exciting games are the ones that are decided by you know, one point. One, one point game is more, excited than, more exciting than anything else, so I don't think we want to outlaw uh, one point games. I think we want to continue to allow those to happen. Yes. I guess maybe going off of that, have you looked at how the Elam ending has impacted the average margin of victory or like the percent of like clutch games maybe that you are able to see if that increases that at all? I've, I've looked at it from a lot of different standpoints. I don't know if I've looked at it necessarily from how it affects margin of victory, but one thing I do look at is the, uh, the prevalence or the, the, uh, yeah, the prevalence of comebacks, I guess I should say. And I think that's a real feature of the Elam ending. You think about what it takes to come back in a game under a timed format. Uh, you're already trailing, and if you, if you want to get the ball back, you're probably going to have to hand away one or two free points to your opponent in the form of free throws. So that works against you right there. And then once you do get the ball back, you have to rush and force up an ugly shot because the clock's working against you. So, so many forces are working against uh, the trailing team already in a timed format in addition to just being behind. Well, with the Elam ending, you take away those forces. You know, you're still facing a deficit, so you're at a disadvantage, and you should be, but you don't have those extra factors working against you. You, you can get the ball back at no cost. You just have to get a legitimate stop. Uh, when you do get the ball back, you can work and get your best look, and that combination of factors has led to some amazing comebacks. Uh, we had a the records just keep getting set with these comebacks. Right now it was set uh, this past summer in the Canadian League. There was a game where a team was down by uh, 14 points when they shut off the clock. And actually, a little bit later on, they were trailing by 16 points. And then it got to a point where they, couldn't, they were truly up against the wall. They couldn't give up one more point. They were down by 12, couldn't give up one more point, and they were able to work their way back and win the game. It was just... Absolutely incredible. So adding that suspense uh, is really cool. And I think the best part is that whether there's a successful comeback or not, uh, the outcome of the game is more satisfying because you're getting to see a more authentic style of play all the way through the end of the game. That's right. So um, I guess kind of all on the same note, for the teams that lose those like games, have you had any uh, pushback? Like, if they were up 12 points and had there been a clock, they would have probably won, and now they lose. How has that worked out? This is funny because it goes back to those early years of TBT play when this was first implemented, and seeing it in action, you know, again, I'm, I'm not sure how people are going to re receive this idea, what they're going to think. And for about the first two years, there was like a clear divide on the feedback that we were getting. The teams that won the games liked it, and the teams that lost the games hated it. Uh, but now what we're actually seeing is you know, more teams, even if they lose the game, they're like, wow, that was, 
like that was just fun to be able to go all out and play and be able to focus on the action on the court rather than having this electronic third party and you know being preoccupied with manipulating the clock. Even the losing teams are starting to enjoy it and see the merit in it. There was really a big uh, kind of test in I think it was 2021 where in TBT where for the first time we were seeing host arenas. You know, because there's, I don't know how familiar you are with TBT, but there's kind of host sites, host teams, and uh, where the host team was losing these games, in, in some cases because of these late comebacks, and the, the fans were still walking away like, wow, that was, that was still really fun, that was still really awesome. So uh, it takes time to get that positive response all around, but we're starting to see that even from the losing side, that wow, this is a really fun format. Uh, you get a more authentic style of play. Thank you. That was a good question. And just dovetailing off of that, have you done any analysis of this? Is you talk a lot about the end of the game. Has there been any consequence or impact to the first three quarters of the game, right? Or anything that you've seen there that the ending has now impacted? Uh, so the question about the, the early part of the game, not so much. I think what you could see, if this continues to be adopted more widely, I think you'll see differences in player substitution patterns, and not, not for the better or worse. I think just uh, because leads are not as safe at the end of the game, it's more likely you might have to have your best players in the game at the, at the end. So that just means you have to adjust substitution patterns maybe early in the, earlier in the game. But also the trade-off to that is that if you implement this uh, in regulation, there is no overtime, or if you implement it in overtime, you're getting rid of multiple overtime. So, so overall, it can save wear and tear over the course of a season for players. So uh, for, from a player standpoint, I think it is uh, truly a win for them. And uh, so we're seeing, again, uh, you know, just all different sorts of stakeholders are, I think it's a win-win all around. So uh, thank you for your question. Hi, um, I'm a big fan of the Elam, Elam ending, especially I watched LeBron's game winner in the All-Star game a couple years ago. Um, my question is, do you think that it can be implemented in any other sports other than basketball? So I love this question. I actually think the Elam ending is a best fit for basketball. And I think that's what really makes it cool is that it's kind of an offer that's on the table, table really for basketball. There's ways that you could make it work in other sports, but you'd, almost, you'd have to change so much about the sport to get the scoring rate right uh, that there's almost, there's kind of too much retrofitting that it kind of takes away the cool factor. With basketball, you put it in place and everything about what you see and hear and feel and experience about the game looks very familiar uh, and, it work, and it can work right away. Whereas again, with other sports, you really have to change a lot uh, about the, whether it's the dimensions of the field, the number of players, you know, different rules to kind of make this work and kind of retrofit it that way. Uh, so I think the, the best fit and what makes it really cool is that it's a, a great fit for basketball. Was, was that the last one? Okay. All right, I think that was the last question. So again, thank you.